Good evening, everybody. It's, uh, it's good to be in the house of the Lord tonight. I hope and pray that you've had a great uh, afternoon. Uh, if you can, can, uh, can ever get you a good nap on a Sunday afternoon, this was definitely nap time kind of weather, uh, I believe. So hopefully you had a little rest today and relaxed today and enjoyed just the Lord's Day. Uh, and uh, here we are again tonight. We've got our kids program back in swing tonight and youth and our activities and our time of worship together as well. And so uh, moving back and moving forward and just trying to do uh, and be and just worship and just be the church. And so I'm glad that you're here with us tonight. Glad that uh, we are part of this time together and uh, just looking forward to singing, looking forward to Uh, being in God's Word together tonight for a few moments. So let's begin with a word of prayer, and Brother Ken's going to come and lead us for a few moments in music. Father, I want to thank you uh, for a beautiful day. Thank you, Father, for this time, the opportunity that we have uh, tonight, Father, just to be again in your presence, to worship together, Uh, just, Father, to be blessed by you, I pray. And so, Father, take this time together tonight, Father, as we sing. Father, as we gather together, take this time as we are in your house to worship you. Uh, Father, just speak to us tonight. Father, move among us tonight. Draw us closer to you tonight, Father. Uh, I pray speak through me as, as, I, as we share and look into the Word of God tonight, Father. May it just be something that is pleasing unto you. And, Father, something that just draws us closer to you. Father, thank you. We love you. And it is in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. We've done this two or three times on a Sunday night, but we're going to sing as we gather. And I'm going to invite y'all to stand during this one. And once again, look around the room. See that person you hadn't made it to. and Give them a wave. That, that air high five, if you want to call it that. But we're going to sing as we gather. And y'all kind of greet each other with a wave or a smile or whatever. So let's sing together. Spirit work within us as we gather may we glorify your name knowing well that as our hearts begin to worship we'll be blessed because we came we'll be blessed because we came we're going to sing it once again join me As we gather, may your spirit work within us. As we gather, may we glorify your name. Knowing well that as our heart begins to worship, we'll be blessed because we came. We'll be blessed because we came. Since you're already standing, we're going to remain standing as we sing, Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus. Y'all know this one. Join me and let's sing together. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross, lift high. not suffer loss from victory unto victory his army shall he lead till every foe and Christ is Lord indeed stand up stand up for Jesus stand strength alone the arm of flesh will fail you put on the gospel armor each piece put on with prayer where duty calls or danger 
be never wanting there. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. This day the noise of battle, the next the victor song to him. Let you be seated. It's Sunday night. I'm going to invite you to do this. You're not going to physically do anything different, but in your mind, I want y'all to relax. Just relax. And consider this like if you were in house church somewhere. We're meeting in somebody's home. This is a really big den, and you're in a padded chair, and we're all just sitting, and we decide to sing together just as fellow church members, believers in Jesus. And relax and sing. We're going to sing one that I think is very appropriate for us today, and you'll see why, and the song will speak for itself. Trust and obey. Join us as we all sing together. But to trust and obey. The delights of his love until all on the altar we lay for the favor he shows and the joy he bestows are for them. trust and obey. Then in fellowship sweet, we will sit at his feet. What he says we will do, where he sends we will go. Never fear all Trust and obey, trust and obey, to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. We're going to sing one of the newer ones that, that we've learned several years ago here. Shout to the Lord. Now, I don't hear a lot of shouting goes on here. Every now and then, Mr. Grady will you know, bring one out. But shout to the Lord. Sometimes, have you ever been in a worship service where you just felt like, i got to say something? No. <laughs> not, a, not a single head. Nobody moved. Nobody breathed. I actually have. And, yeah, I'm a little Baptist, born and raised, but... You know, 
you find yourself about 10 feet farther down the aisle and when it's time to sit down, you have to go back and find your seat. It was awesome, but nothing unusual. It was just, I need to get closer to the front. We're going to sing, shout to the Lord. My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your mighty love. Join us as we sing. of your mighty love. My comfort, my shelter, tower of refuge and strength, let every breath, all that I am, never cease to walk. sound of your name. I sing for joy Y'all for singing. <laughs> Open your Bibles with me tonight, of course, back into and still looking at the book of Psalms. We've uh, been looking into the 119th chapter uh, here the last, I guess this will be about the fourth week. And so a couple of verses that I want to share with you tonight are found in verses 59 and 60. Okay. Psalms 119 verses 59 and 60. Give you a second just to find us there. 119 verses 59 
and 60. It says, I thought about my ways and turned my steps back to your decrees. I hurried, not hesitating to keep your commands. Pray with me for a moment. Father, uh, help us. Help us to hurry, to not hesitate, to, to keep your commands, to, to turn back to you, Father, to know you, to, to be a child of God, Father, to be what you would have us to be. Father, bless this, the reading of your word tonight. Uh, bless these few moments that we have together this evening. May thy will truly be done, I pray. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Tonight, as we look in our scripture verses, I think what the writer is giving to us tonight is really just a, a quick idea of what it means to, to be converted. You know, conversion is a pretty big deal, and, and we see things like that happening all around us today. We, we see you, know, you can be converted to anything. You know, I mean, there's people who change their minds about whatever. You know, people that are converted to, uh, you know, I guess you could say communism, fascism, uh, Catholicism, Protestantism, any kind of ism, I guess, that there is that's out there. I mean, people can be converted in a whim. But what the writer is talking to us tonight and what we need to understand tonight and kind of just kind of sharing a, a general topic tonight is the idea of what is true spiritual conversion, what is really real, what it really means to be converted. Now, I share that with, I know, again, speaking to the choir maybe on Sunday nights and to those folks that are at home watching us tonight as well. But I think we need to understand as we encounter other individuals, as maybe we have opportunities to, to share Christ, as we begin to share Christ with our kids and grandkids to, to gain a true understanding of what it means to be converted. Let me read the text to you again as the psalmist writes. He says, I thought about my ways and turned my steps back to your decrees. You know, conversion, what it really is, what the, the Bible says that it is. Conversion is not something that, that's toward a religion or it's not something that's just toward a church or, or toward a creed. But conversion is something that happens between an individual and another person. And, and I guess maybe even in our case, we could say three people, the, the Godhead of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's a, it's a combination of, of all three, and it's a relationship between all three that makes that different. It is that whole life that we have being turned into a right relationship with God. That relationship that is known of, uh, of being a trustful thing between our Heavenly Father through Jesus Christ, who is our personal Savior, but it's also brought about by the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. It's that being, con that, that, that conversion experience that, that changes everything for all of eternity, but, but there's something special about it. In Matthew chapter 18, I just want to throw this verse out there at you for a moment. It's Matthew 18, verse 3. Jesus says, truly I tell you, he said, unless you become, excuse me, unless you turn and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. You know, I wonder why sometimes so many of our uh, uh, folks in our churches or so many people that, that come to know the Lord are, are younger. You know, there is something about a, a childlike faith that just, it goes, all, it, go, it goes beyond this idea of trying to figure it out mentally. It goes beyond this idea of trying to understand everything. Children, honestly, children just have faith. They just believe. And man, believing in God, believing through Christ, believing in the power of the Holy Spirit, believing in truly being converted, man, that's what it's all truly about. 
Statistics tell us over and over again, not just in the Southern Baptist Convention, I dare say this is probably true all over, all over every Christian denomination that's out there, that you know, children of a younger age, the percentage of, of conversion experiences for them are a lot greater than you know, when you begin beginning those teenage years, it drastically drops. And you get into those 20s, it drastically drops. And, and you get above the 20, 30, 40 year age, I mean, it drastically almost goes down to nothing of individuals who come to know the Lord. So that verse there, when Jesus says, unless we turn and become like little children, we'll never enter into the kingdom of heaven. I mean, we know we can't go back in time, but there is something about a childlike faith that's what it really means to be converted. I want to share a few thoughts with you tonight about conversion, about what that childlike faith can bring to us, about what Christian conversion is all about. And it starts with just that. A true Christian conversion begins with a, a serious consideration. The psalmist says here, I, I thought about my ways. I tell you, folks, somebody to be, be saved, especially in, in, in somebody that's, that, that's not like a child, I shall, shall I say, someone that's maybe a little bit older. Man, we need to think about it. People need to think about what's going on. We need to think about God. We need to think about life. We need to pay attention to, to sin, to time, to eternity. There is so much. He says, I thought about my ways. You see, the only thing that, that an adult must do, the thing that adult, an adult must do is, is understand the idea of being lost. You see, for a lot of children that come to the Lord, they understand a little bit about sin. And, and here's my thing, folks, with kids. It, they don't have to have the theology of an adult to become a, a child of God. They just have to believe. And they don't have all the answers and they don't know all of the biblical lingo and things that are out there. But oh man, I tell you, there's just something about a child who just has a true faith in Christ that just moves mountains. As we get a little older and as folks get a little older and they begin to think about conversion, they begin to think about, about salvation and, and those things. There's a lot of things for them to consider. They, they do have to consider God. They do have to consider what's going on around them and sin and time and eternity and all of these things. Isaiah even puts it together like this in Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18. He says, come, let's settle this. Now, that's pretty neat when God says that. You know, it, it, there's no other playing around. There's no other way to look at it. Come, let's settle this, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. They are as crimson red. They will be like wool. Man, and, and until we do this, understand, until we consider what's going on around us, until we pay attention to, to, to what's there, I thought about my ways, until we do this, we really can't be saved. We really can't have that spiritual conversion that needs to take place in all of our lives, need to take place and, and is a move of changing with, around us and changing through us over and over again. We face a, a deep sense of what's going on, a serious consideration of what's taking place. So that Christian conversion begins with that. And conversion begins with that serious consideration. Think about, if you would, with me for a moment. I know I haven't preached this parable yet on Sunday mornings, but it's, it's the parable, parable excuse me, of the prodigal son. And, and it comes from Luke chapter 15. And so I want to read a few verses out of that for you tonight. Verses 17 to 19 says this. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired workers have more than enough food and here I am dying of hunger. I'll get up and go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired workers. The serious consideration, I tell you, 
The prodigal son, the Bible says it came to his senses. I know a lot of folks out there, and you probably do too, that, that need to come to their senses. And they haven't done that yet. You know, we can pray for them, and we can share Christ with them. But uh, they're in the midst of some deep, dark times, I guess you could say, and they haven't yet come to their senses. Pray that they will. Pray that they'll come to their senses in, in such a way that it changes their eternity. It changes their life. You know, it was only until this prodigal son, only until he realized just how foolish he was, just how much he needed his father's love, just how much he needed his father's provision, just how much his father could do for him, that he, quote, came to his senses. And so there's a serious consideration that must take place for true spiritual conversion to happen. But not only did a Christian conversion begin with a serious consideration, serious consideration leads us to a definite action. He says, I thought about my ways and turned my steps back to your decrees. A man thinks about God. A man thinks, about hard, thinks hard and seriously about what God is doing in his life, about what salvation needs to take place in his own soul, his own needs. And that those, those thought processes, those serious considerations, ladies and gentlemen, leads to action. I've had people tell me before, well, preacher, I'm saved. And I'm saying, Really? You know, when, when did you tell somebody? Well, I've never told anybody. You know those two things are not biblical, right? There's no such thing as a closet Christian. You may be in the closet about a lot of other things in life, but buddy, you can't be in the closet and be a child of God. It's time for that to get out of the closet, okay? If you're a child of God, stand up and be a child of God. If he's your Lord and Savior, stand up to the world and say, hey, this is my Lord. This is my Savior. I, I've had folks and seen folks in church. Well, pre well preacher, I, I've never walked down the aisle before, but I'm saved. Really? Hey, I understand 100%. Walking down the aisle saves nobody. Being baptized saves nobody. But the Bible does tell us we have to stand up for what we believe in. The Bible does tell us that we need to declare in front of the world that I am a child of God. And how do we do that? I, I don't know that we as Southern Baptists have the, have the right way of doing things. But I tell you what, walking down that aisle is a way of declaring to the world that I am a child of God. Being baptized, it doesn't save you, but it's a way of saying, hey, I'm going to follow my Lord and follow my Savior. Man, I'm going to have a definite action in my life that's going to move me to be more like Jesus. I'm going to follow him. And it's going to make a difference in my life. Something has to happen. Something needs to take place. I told you about the prodigal son. Well, verse 20 says this. So he got up and went to his father. Listen, he could, have been, he could have been in that foreign land and he could have thought about how good his dad would have been to him. He could have thought about how the, 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 the folks who worked for his dad were taken care of, and how they were always fed. He could have thought about all of those things. He could have understood and knew all of those things. But until he, until he actually got up and went to his father, nothing in his life changed. And man, we can be in a world today and people can know about Jesus and talk about Jesus and know who he is and wear little crosses and do all kinds of, quote, nice things and wonderful things. But until folks really take action, until they get up and go to the Father, nothing has changed. And oh, there is a definitely a serious consideration that needs to take place in our lives. 
He got up, it says, he went to his father, but while his son was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion, ran and threw his arms around his neck and kissed him. I mean, the prodigal son came to a point where he said, I've got to get up and go home. But the wonderful thing about it was his dad was waiting for him. Now, daddy didn't go get him. He didn't drag him home. The son had to have a definite action. The son had to do that for it to be real, and for it to be true. So here in the moment of, uh, of clarity, the, the prodigal son really kind of turns his back on the life that he thought he wanted and went back home to the life that he knew he needed. And everything changed. Everything got better. Everything moved in a way that it had maybe never moved before. Think about it for a moment. Think about the moment in time, whether you were a young person, a child even. I was eight years old. I remember eight years old when I gave my life to Jesus. Man, there's been so much more that have gone, gone on in my life since then. You talk about a childlike faith. Yeah, it was. It was just a childlike faith. But it was that stepping stone. Salvation is something that continues in our life. It's not just a one-time moment. It's a, it's a continuation. It's, and God is, is continually, I can't lose my salvation, but he's continually saving me over and over again. And, and as I, I strive to serve him and live for him and just be what he wants me to be, it's these, these definite, de definite actions in my own life today over and over again, folks, just clarify and prove and, and show that, that God is who he says he is. And that I follow him. Good days and bad days. And that he loves me. No matter what. Then think about for a moment. Those, that time when, when you. I pray gave your life to Christ. You see when the son came home. The prodigal son it is. All he wanted was to eat. He wanted the basics. But God didn't give him the basics. His father didn't just give him the basics. Man, he, he grabbed him up. He gave him a hug. But the Bible tells us as well that he, he, he put a robe on him. He put a ring on his finger. They killed the fatted calf. Man, they had a party. Because it was a big deal. Salvation, ladies and gentlemen, true, born again salvation, it's a big deal. It's an eternity changer. It's a big deal. And oh, to see that, that the serious consideration that we have that's leading us to a definite action. But there's another step as well. That definite action leads to a loving obedience. That Psalms verse also says, I hurried, not hesitating, to keep your commandments. Definite action doesn't stop short of this point. It takes that next step. It has to, listen to me, it has to lead to a life of obedience. That's not a maybe. Salvation is not a maybe, ladies and gentlemen. We, we don't have the option, oh, I want to be saved and then still live the life I want to live. It doesn't work that way. If we're going to be a child of God, and we've got to do our best. Yes, we are sinners saved by grace, but we must live a life of obedience to Christ, to God, to our Heavenly Father. To do all of these things that, that make a difference. I love how in the Bible there's, there's examples of what we need to do. And when I think about this, taking this action and, and it leading to obedience, man, the Bible's just full of that. 
It's full of individuals who, who followed and took an action, who, who made a change, and man, it led to an obedience that changed the lives of others. Zacchaeus was a wee little man. And a wee little man was he? Okay, I'm not going to sing the song. Man, Zacchaeus was that guy that he was wrong. I mean, he cheated people. He stole from people. And he met Jesus. Man, there is a, a definite action in his life. And he changed. Man, a life of obedience. The Bible tells us that he went back and gave back to all those folks. I mean, if he had stolen from them, he gave back what he stole from them and then some. I mean, think about that for a moment. He didn't want there to be any discrep discrepancies. He didn't want there to be any, anybody to say that, 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 hey, I know he was giving back money, but he didn't give me back all my money. Yes, he did. He gave you back all of your money and then some. He made sure that he fixed everything. Man, can you imagine? We talk about obedience. A loving obedience. I, I wonder sometimes, and just kind of a little side note here, because the, the Bible doesn't tell us like Zacchaeus, what, what happened through the rest of his life? I can only imagine the kind of believer he was. The lives that he touched the people that he influenced. Can you imagine? But not only Zacchaeus, we, I, I, I think about the, the Samaritan woman. And Jesus meets her and, you know, got a husband, not the right husband. You've had a whole bunch of husbands. I mean, Jesus knew everything about her. He, knew, he knows everything about us. And, and he just, I mean, he touched her life. And as he touched her life, she was changed. And as she was changed, the Bible tells us she goes back and, and she tells the folks back in her town, hey, I met this guy there. He's Jesus. He's the Savior. He's the Messiah. He's the Lord. And, and all these folks came and the Bible says, I mean, this woman here was, honestly, she had four or five husbands. She was sleeping around and all of a sudden she became a missionary. Man, that's a God thing, folks. Her life changed in such a way, she was telling other people, let me tell you about my Jesus. Man, that's salvation. That's a, a definite action that leads to some loving obedience. Of course, we always talk about Paul when we think, think about things like this. And so, yeah, he was, he's another one. And God changed his life, and whether you and I realize it or not, he changed ours because of what we have right here. Paul's letters, Paul being put in jail so he could write letters, <laughs> so much is there. Cornelius in Acts chapter 10, man, his conversion led to a desire to evangelize his whole family. And honestly, I, that's what conversion ought to do to us. Man, if there's people in our family that don't know Jesus and we're a Christian, we ought to have a desire to tell them about Christ. We can't save them, but man, we can spread that seed. Cornelius had that. It was so real, so true, and it just touched his life. The first sermon I ever preached, I kind of mentioned that a little bit this morning, I guess, you know, in, in one of the sermons, I don't know which one it was now, but Acts chapter 16, I mean, that was the first sermon I ever preached, and there's the jailer there, and, and man, Paul and him are in, in, in prison, and, and, and all this stuff is happening, all this stuff is taking place, and, and then the, the, you know, the earthquake happens, everything takes place there in Acts chapter 16, and the jailer gets saved. I love it because if you look, I think it's around verse 30 or something like that. It talks about and he was saved and it says, and his whole household. That's awesome. That's a definite action leading to a loving obedience that makes a difference in so many people's lives. 
The Bible tells us as well in Ephesus about the folks in the inside of the church. That they had a desire to, to, take a, to, to take a break from their old way and just to start all over again. In Acts chapter 19 is where we actually kind of see a little bit about that. In Acts chapter 19 verses 18 and 19 it says, And many who had become believers came confessing and disclosing their practices. Here's what's happening. Let me kind of, I guess, need to explain it a little bit more too. There in the city of Ephesus, it was, it was witchcraft. And so there were a lot of books that were evil, that were of the devil. And in Acts chapter 19, verses 18 and 19, we, we see what happens when people get right with the Lord. It said, and many who had become believers came confessing and disclosing their practices. In other words, their practices of witchcraft and things of that nature. Verse 19, while many of those who had practiced magic collected their books and burned them in front of everyone. So they calculated their value and found it to be 50,000 pieces of silver. Now, folks, that's a lot of that day and time. 50,000 pieces of silver would be a pretty good little bit today. But can you, do you understand what's taking place here? Do you understand that, that when salvation comes, that when there's a, a definite action that takes place in a person's, person's life, that it, that it leads to a loving obedience that these folks who had practiced witchcraft and practiced magic realized, listen, that if I'm going to do this right, what do I got to do? Let's light the matches and get rid of this mess. You know, they didn't put it on eBay and try to sell it to somebody else just to get it out of their house. No, this stuff shouldn't be around. Let's just burn it and get rid of it. And that's what they did. I, I love it. Because the Bible is full of examples of folks who get right with the Lord. Who realize what they need to do. And then obedience, they follow God. Whatever that is. Spiritual conversion is described real quickly, three words. Stop, turn, and obey. Stop living a life of sin. Turn to the Father of the world and obey Him. And so tonight, we stop, we turn, we obey. I know I look out tonight and I see a lot of folks, we're in the obey stage, I hope and pray, of our lives. Understand this, ladies and gentlemen, that as we are obedient to God, we influence others. As we are obedient and following Him, we are influencing those around us. I can only imagine... There in Acts chapter 19, those outside of the church who saw what was going on, I, I'm telling you, books of that day and time were expensive. Books of that day and time were very rare. And for them folks to be out there burning books of that day and time, it made an impression on a lot of other lost people around them. And I dare say because of that, I don't know for sure, but I dare say that because of that, I believe probably others come to know Christ because of their obedience to him. Ladies and gentlemen, I will promise you this. I believe this beyond a shadow of any doubt. That others can and will come to know Christ if we will be obedient to him. Let's pray. Father, thank you for just a few moments together tonight. Father, to think about what it means to be converted. Father, to think about what it means to follow you. And so, Father, I pray that this evening as we conclude our time here together, Father, I pray that, that we will just move and, and Father, follow you, that uh, we will be what you would have us to be in every aspect of our life. Father, help us as believers to obey. Father, help us to influence others for Christ Help us, Father, to be what you would have us to be. I pray, Father, that this is a glorious week in the life of our church. 
Father, I pray that in each of our lives individually that you will give us the time and the opportunity to to share Christ, to live for Christ, to be obedient to Christ, to make a difference in this world in which we live. We are blessed, Father, beyond measure. And I thank you for all that you do for us. And I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all for coming and worshiping. Those at home for tuning in and worshiping with us tonight. Uh, We'll see you, I hope, and pray on Wednesday night. We've got the women's Bible study. All the other activities are taking place at 6 o'clock on Wednesday evening. Come out and join us. And may God bless you this week. Thank you.